And all who agreed with that prayer said, Amen. Good morning. How many noticed the lobby looked a little bit different when you came in? There's still some people out there trying to play the games. We, we, we try to pull the plugs. By the way, in case you don't know, this, this might be interesting information for you. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, last month, uh, you guys contributed towards uh, the pastoral team as just giving words of encouragement and sometimes gifts. And so those have been distributed and we just wanna say thank you so much. We don't ever expect anything like that. It's always a surprise to us and we're always grateful for it. So thank you so much. Another thing you might not know is today is actually our executive pastor, Jonathan Sigmund's birthday. And it also marks the 12th anniversary of him serving our church family here at Calvary Assembly. So he thinks all the stuff in the lobby is for him, and that's okay. <laughs> you give him a high five today and, and, and celebrate him. We're so glad that, uh, that he's here, and we're glad that you're here to join in the celebration today. Um, we're gonna go ahead and release children for their classes. And if you are a student in student ministry, you're actually staying in the room with us today. It's not because we don't have an option, it's because on the first Sunday of the month, we always include you in our gathering. And so we're glad that you're sticking with us. While they're making their way to their class, if you can reach into the card slot of the chair back in front of you, there's a connection card. If you can pull that out and fill that out, it helps us serve you. Um, prayer requests are listed there and it helps us know how to pray for you. Sometimes there's a deeply personal matter and you just mark uh, for pastor's eyes only. When that happens, it, it actually gets sent to me and I lift you up in prayer. And sometimes those things are actually anonymous in pastor's eyes only. Uh, what I'm grateful for is while I may not know who it is, God does and he can, he can uh, answer those prayers. So if you can just take a half a minute to uh, fill that out, and then we're actually gonna start our message by watching a little recap of what's happened over the last 36 months. Can we just give thanks to God for all he has done? Um, sometimes technology works and sometimes it doesn't. The reason we've gathered today and our focus point is to say thank you to God for all he has given to us and all he has done for us. 36 months ago, we asked our church family if you were willing to make real sacrifices. 
not for ourselves, but for people that we might not know yet, or if we did know, they didn't know God yet. And you all said yes. And we set out to create more space for more grace, which I think, if anything, our recent history has taught us is our world needs more places like that. We wanted room for children to be able to discover the goodness of God at the very earliest age possible. We wanted space for our students to be able to not only learn to trust in the faithfulness of God, but to live with the kind of confidence that he's helping them day in and day out. We wanted young families to trust the wisdom of God and to take what they were learning and pass it on to their children so that their children could grow to be all that God intended them to be. We wanted our college students and our young adults to actually discover the adventure that God was calling them to and to pursue it with like-minded friends. And we wanted our seniors to connect deeply and continue to bear fruit because with God there actually is always a next. So when we launched this campaign 36 months ago, there were lots of creative ways that people found to try to increase some possible resources that they could contribute to this. Some people stopped buying coffee at their favorite coffee shop. Some people delayed home purchases or vacations. Some people cashed out an investment and turned that money in. There were lots of creative ways to reduce expenses or maybe even increase income. And the purpose was not to build a better building for ourselves. We never wanted that. We were out of space, but we were convinced God still had more grace. And we know there are lots of people who haven't experienced his grace for themselves. So we wanted them to experience that, whether they were young or whether they were old, whether they were well-resourced or under-resourced, whether they were single, whether they were married, whether they were kids or no kids, it, whether they were male or female, it doesn't matter. We want everyone to experience the grace of God. That's a really good place for an amen. The grace of God always meets us where we are, but never leaves us as we are. I'm so grateful that we didn't have to get our lives in order and meet a certain metric in order to qualify getting into rooms like this one. God doesn't wait until we're who we want to be or who he wants us to be before he begins to saturate our lives, our heart with his grace. And when we do this, it makes a huge difference in how we think about ourselves and how we think about our world. Now, in this adventure, there has been a lot of people that I wish I could give credit to all the names of. I do want to point out a few this morning, and two in particular. One is Glenn Stacy, and the other is Phil Lepore. And you might not actually know who they are, but they were individuals who were part of our church family, and they, they are members of our church family, and they had businesses, and they decided to set aside their own businesses and focus on our construction project. One is a project manager to oversee the construction, and one is clerk at the works to see the handling of all of the finances uh, for our effort. And their willingness to do that saved, the, saved us hundreds of thousands of dollars. How many are grateful for the work that they put in? Amen? Yeah. And then we had a, we had an incredible ministry team, uh, Jonathan Sigmund, Steve Otto, Ben Longenbaugh, Stephen Nichols, Alexi Anderson, John Iacucci, John Abarca, Julian Torres, Melissa Davies, Emily, Mary Ann, all of these did an unbelievable amount of work. I, I wish you could have seen behind the scenes, but even watching it would wear you out. It's just astonishing how many times they kept showing up and giving their very best so that each and every one of us could experience something like this. Could we just say thank you to each and every one of them this morning? Amen. So I actually remember quite vividly the first Sunday of November in 2018 when we decided we would make the ask and see if you were willing to help us create more space so more people could experience more grace. And in that season, we met together for questions and we had conversations and we gathered for prayer. There's one night particular about prayer. It's, it's, three years later, it's, it's still so emotional to me because there was a person who came who wanted to help pray and ask God for guidance and, and for help in our efforts. And I knew the struggles that this young man was having in his life. 
and they were consequential, but God had done enough already that he thought other people should at least experience this too. And I watched a person who could demonstrate almost no confidence in any other area of life stand in a position of prayer and command the blessings of God. It's a remarkable thing what grace does to you. We gathered for prayer and we had meals together. If I remember, I think it was Chick-fil-A and Chipotle, yes. <laughs> According to some people around here, when Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, that's what came down from heaven. <laughs> I remember us singing in those vision meetings and uh, with nothing more than uh, Ben at a guitar. By the way, I should have mentioned Ben Longenbaugh if I didn't earlier. What a phenomenal uh, help he's been to us in this project. In fact, he played a role in this that a lot of you wouldn't know, and I wish I had time to tell you all. And... Uh, it was just him and a guitar, and we, we sang the roof off the old auditorium. I don't know that I've ever heard more joyous praise. It stands out as a highlight in my life, not just in a campaign, but in my life to this day. Um, in our project, we actually had to change architects. Uh, our design was running into challenges that we, every time we tried to solve them, it created another set of problems. And the architectural firm was very committed to helping us, but they were losing staff and they were having trouble keeping up. And so we asked if they'd be willing to hand off the project and they said yes. And we reached out to the company that had helped us with our site engineering, uh, Passero, and we said, is there any chance you would have the capacity to take this project on? And they said yes. And they did a phenomenal job. How many are grateful for the design and the space that they put together? It really is something. Before there were a solid roof on and the walls were all up, a lot of us gathered in this space with permanent markers. And we discerned the promises that we felt God was speaking to us personally and to our church family. And we wrote them on the cement of this room. And on the the beams over the doorways. When you came in and you were standing for worship this morning, you are literally standing on promises that people felt God whispered to their heart. It's a very powerful thing. And, uh, and then came COVID. And uh, we couldn't gather any longer. And it, it was just, I mean, it's still a source of, of concern and frustration to many people. But I can remember us thinking that when they stopped our gathering in March, we'd be back by Easter. And uh, we miscalculated. And in our state, all 90 central construction was shut down. And they didn't consider church construction essential. And so we had to send all of our people home. Uh, we, we did everything we could to appeal to anyone that we thought was either the governor or had access to the governor. And we sent emails and we made phone calls and we wrote letters and we, we did everything we possibly could. Our project manager, finally one day, th there's, no, there's no work to, to manage. And he just looked at us, he said, I, I can't be here. I, I can't in good conscience take any money for what I'm doing. And I, I still need to provide for my family. So I'm, I'm gonna have to go find something else. And he, he packed up all his tools and he started walking out the door. And that's when we got the email that said, we had a waiver from the governor of the state of New York and we could go back to work on our project. <laughs> I have never seen Phil Lepore move so fast. <laughs> headed Glenn off in the parking lot and, and we went back to work. And what I was really thrilled about that is that there were a lot of people, this was their source of income and there was no construction in our area and their families were taken care of because of a project that we had permission to go forward with. That was a really big day. And then we actually had to decide if we were going to, to, to launch and initiate uh, the children's ministry project, which is taking our old auditorium and converting it to two stories of children's ministry space. And we weren't meeting, 
And we decided we would go ahead and do that. And because we weren't meeting at that time, we actually accelerated uh, that part of the expansion. We, we completed that ahead of schedule. And we renovated our student ministry space. Our, our children's ministry space is called Adventure Kids because we want them to know that the life with God is an adventure and it's one worth taking. And our student ministry is called Second because they've decided to put God and others first. How many think that's a really good idea? Yeah. And, well, honestly, that sounded a little weak. How many think that's a good idea? There you go. <laughs> Just to put it in perspective, we have students that haven't graduated high school that have decided that God and others are more important than themselves. Yeah. They didn't get that idea on social media, I can tell you that. They got that idea in God's Word and in God's presence, and, and we're so grateful for that. And what I'd like to do is just share maybe a couple of testimonies. Someone who's been around here pre-construction and someone who started coming since construction, just to give you a sense of how God's grace is impacting their lives. Calvary. Um, right after it reopened last August, um, we actually started attending online. It wasn't until we were worshiping here in the sanctuary, and I just felt the, the same feeling you feel at Thanksgiving when a feast is put before you. Um, as the, the worship team was up there leading us, um, I just felt like I was coming to the Thanksgiving table and being fed so fully. We've been coming here since nine years ago now, nine years, and um, I'd always kind of had caveats of um, going to Bible studies and stuff like that through the Catholic Church, but it was nothing like being here. It was nothing like it. You know, I, I feel like it might sound silly, but um, we now drive almost 25 minutes to get to church um, because it, it's worth it, but that also gives us time in the car on the way home to go over what just happened and talk about you know different points that stood out to us in the sermon or whatever and i feel like especially with kids that are older having them trapped in the car for that time <laughs> they can't get away from the discussion and the questions and so we we really enjoy using that time when we heard about rooted the bible study coming up um, I knew right away I wanted to be part of it. I knew, it just, it spoke to me. And starting Rooted Together was was a journey that brought Joe and I closer. And I'd ask Joe, hey, you wanna do this with me? Let's do it as a couple. You know, we would read with each other. We would um, we would talk about some of the things in the book. We would, we would have input about things that we just never talked about. Coming from a smaller community and smaller church previously, it's been great for my kids to see that there's plenty of other kids their age um, that do go to church and want to grow up their Christian faith. You can't make this stuff up. Like that faithfulness shows that God listens, God loves you. And when God bestows these graces and these blessings upon you, you just sometimes you feel like I'm not worthy of it. I didn't do anything special here, God. I'm just trying to follow you and, and become part of you. I think just being able to um, reflect on moments from Sunday morning throughout the week um, that I can go back to and draw from, it, it gives me a strength to get through any tough times during the week. By God's grace, we're experiencing His grace in the space we're sitting in right now. And I know a lot of you sacrificed a lot for this. And today, I'm able to say our building project is complete. It's actually been complete for a while, but yeah. And, and this concludes our capital campaign, but I also want you to hear from me that ministry is never done. A project can be complete. But as long as there's anybody 
anyone who hasn't connected with God themselves. We still have work to do. Because with God, there is always a next. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of an update because I know we don't, get, we don't talk a lot about these things very often. I thought I might take a, a minute or two to do that today. God has been very faithful to you in this season and you have been faithful with what he's been faithful to you and we're so grateful for that. When we launched our capital campaign, the total commitments that were turned in was $1.2 million. And you have to appreciate that for a church our size, that's an enormous amount of money. And so what, uh, and, and during that time we had COVID and shut down and all of that. What I can tell you this morning is of that $1.2 million that was committed, over $1.1 million has come in. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And you may recall that before we ever launched our campaign, our, the elders of our church had recommended that we set aside money. Before we ever asked for money from anyone else, we wanted to show that we took this seriously enough to set aside money. So we already had one half million dollars set aside for our construction project. So when I say 1.1 million, that doesn't include that. And so we got off to a great start and uh, uh, as a result of your faithfulness, we were actually, in, in case you don't know how this works with, with banks and, and loans and things, we had to put our money in first. And we had our project broken up into three uh, phases. And so there was an amount of money we had to put in first on the uh, auditorium and lobby portion. And then uh, we had to upfront money on the children's, children's ministry portion. And uh, so we had to put that money in before they would put theirs in. They wanted to know we were serious enough. And so the amount of money that we put in in advance of taking any loans comes to $1.8 million cash went out of this place to help create this place. That's a good place to say thank you to God too. That's incredibly faithful. And in the last 12 months, uh, uh, we are, we've been meeting here and our construction project has by and large been complete, though our capital is just completing. So we have been receiving money towards our capital campaign over the last 12 months. In fact, in the last 12 months, just about $300,000 has come in. And we had already paid out all of our upfront uh, money to the, to the construction and, uh, and we'd been already back to meeting. So it might be worth you knowing what we did with that $300,000. And what we did is we took that $300,000 and we applied it to the principal of our loan. So this year we paid down on our mortgage $300,000. Yeah. And all of this sounds like a, a whole lot of money and, and maybe it feels like it's self-serving to you. Another moment I was really proud of, uh, while we were trying to raise money as we became aware of a missionary opportunity in Ecuador where a person who devoted really decades of their lives, actually he and his wife, had created churches all through a, a region, but, but they didn't have a central location to train up leadership and uh, both train people theologically as well as for leadership. And so they were building what they called a seminary in the jungle. And in the middle of our capital campaign, we came to our church family and asked if you'd be willing to support that because we've always committed that we will not consume everything that comes into this house, that we want to contribute. We want to be known for generosity. And so at the time when we needed money the most, we decided we would see if we could help someone else with their project. And our goal in that project was $5,000. That would purchase the property for them. And so we asked you if you would help us out and you contributed over $13,000 and we sent every dime of that to them. And we're grateful for what God is doing in the raising up of leaders in Ecuador. Um, we've served families who are facing emergencies and struggling financially. We've supported ministries in our town, in our region, and across our globe that aren't us. They're just doing really good things. What I want you to know is that when you give to Calvary, you give to the world. We want to be as generous as we possibly can. 
So I'm kind of running out of time, and this is kind of a consecration and dedication service, and I'll kind of explain what those words mean to us in just a minute. But my thoughts as I thought about this day were drawn back to another building project in the Old Testament, honestly a much bigger uh, and bolder construction project than the one we've undertaken. It was the temple built by Solomon. And uh, King Solomon was the, the king of Israel, and he wanted to create a space where the name of God could be known and the people of God could have access. And so it was a huge project, and when it was complete, he called everyone together, and he wanted to consecrate the space. And consecrate means to set aside. We're going to identify the purpose. This is what this place will be used for. And then he wanted to dedicate the people, which means this is how we will use our energy and our resources in this space. And I'd like to read to you a few of the things he said on that day. Uh, in 1 Kings, the 8th chapter, the 30th verse, it says, Hear the supplication of your servant and of your people, Israel, when they pray toward this place. Hear from heaven your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. What he's saying is, let this place remind everyone that you are aware of what's going on in our lives and that you actually care what happens to us. And when we make mistakes and we call on you, we ask you to forgive. Does that sound like a house of grace? Yeah, it does. First Kings 8.31, when anyone wrongs their neighbor and is required to take an oath and they come to swear the oath before your altar in this temple, then hear from heaven and act. Sometimes people got into situations where they didn't agree on what the solution was. Someone was injured, a person maybe didn't think it was intentional or the person was exaggerating whatever the loss was. And they said that what could happen is you could come to a place like this and it wasn't just God's watching so you better get it right. It was when you come into the presence of God, he will give you wisdom and knowledge and understanding to know what to do. And when you make a promise in front of him, he will give you the strength and the courage to be able to fill it up. Uh, complete it. How many think that sounds like a house of grace? It does. And then in 1 Kings, the 8th chapter, the 33rd verse, it says, when your people Israel have been defeated by an enemy because they have sinned against you, and when they turn back to you and give praise to your name, praying and making supplication to you in this temple, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them back to the land you gave to their ancestors. What he's saying is, when our choices have weakened us and we have caused defeat as a result of it, then we're asking you to hear from heaven when we turn our voices back to you and to forgive and to bring us back into a good place. Does that sound like a house of grace? I think it does. And then 1 Kings 8, chapter the 37th verse, when famine or plague comes to the land or blight or mildew or locusts or grasshoppers or COVID, no, that's not in there. But, or when an enemy besieges them in any of their cities, whatever disaster or disease may come, and when a prayer or plea is made by anyone among your people Israel, being aware of the afflictions of their own hearts and spreading their hands towards this temple, then hear from heaven, your dwelling place. Forgive and act. Deal with everyone according to all they do since you know their hearts, for you alone know every human heart. Let this place remind us that you actually care what's going on in our lives and when we suffer loss. Forgive and act, which reminds us that grace is not just about forgiveness. That grace is more than just forgiveness, but it includes forgiveness. And deal with everyone according to their hearts because we have a lot of ideas about what is going on on the inside of a person when they take certain actions or say certain things. But God is the only one who actually knows. And how many would prefer he handled the situation than we handled the situation, amen? Does that sound like a house of grace? I think it does. And then in verse 41, as long for, as for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but come from a distant land because of your name, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. And when they come and pray toward this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. I love this next thing. Do 
whatever the foreigner asks of you, so that all peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and may know that this house I have built bears your name. This is fascinating. Solomon's saying, we're not going to exclude anybody. You don't have to be from here. If you come here, we want the grace of God to influence your life. And when they are inspired to pray because of what they see and what they hear, then I'm asking that you answer any requests that they make because then they will know that there is a God in heaven who actually cares and actually has power to act. And this, is, uh, this happened... on the day when we were receiving commitments, three years ago today, we had a person in the room from a foreign land and believed in another God. He had another faith. And he came into our space and he heard us say that we're not going to build something for ourselves. We're going to build it for someone else. And we're not trying to make a name for ourselves. We want the name of God to be famous. And I watched him spread his hands and ask God for something and write down the name of someone that he wanted God to help and bring it up to the front and put it on one of our poster boards. That's what's supposed to happen. That's the way it's supposed to be. That is a house of grace. And when your people go to war against their enemies, whenever, where, wherever you send them, and they pray to the Lord toward the city that you have chosen and the temple I have built for your name, then hear from heaven their prayer and their plea and uphold their cause. This isn't looking for or picking personal fights. This isn't a culture of dominance. Did you notice what he said was, where you send us? There's a huge conflict in our culture, and I don't know what to do about it. But there are people who would abhor any use of force, and then there are also people who are very frustrated that injustice is allowed to, to go on without someone standing up and doing something about it. And the challenge is, is that when humans try to do this on their own merits and on their own strength and on their own understanding, at best we do an incomplete job and sometimes we do a corrupting effort. And so he says, when, when they have to go places that you send them, then uphold their cause because it's still a house of grace. And I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. Praise be to the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel, just as he promised. Not one word has failed of all the good promises he gave through his servant Moses. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our ancestors. May he never leave us nor forsake us. Never will he leave you. Never will he forsake you. Whatever has happened or whatever you've done, You can't get to the part where God gives up on you. I've met a lot of people where they gave up on God. But it doesn't go the other way around. Never, never forgiven, never forsaken, never abandoned. It's a house of grace. So in that spirit, we ask God not to build a monument to ourselves, you won't find my name on anything around here except the letter that I write. This place is not about a person. This place is not about a reputation of a community of faith. This place, this space, is built on the conviction that every square foot can be a place where someone in our world connects with the grace of God maybe for the first time, or maybe just the next time, but we want it to happen every time. Can someone say amen to that? Every single time, every single time. 
With God, there's always an exit. It's, it's not a statement of obligation. It's a statement of hope. He's not done with you. He's not done with us. He's not done with our world. It's a statement of faith. So you heard in the video, there's a word that's used. We actually don't use it a lot around here. Sanctuary. Do you know what the word sanctuary means? It means literally a safe place. If you've heard of a bird sanctuary or an animal sanctuary, it means it's a place for them to not have to worry about survival. Years and years ago, if you were in trouble and some force was after you, you could literally run to a church and you could stand inside of its walls and you could yell the word sanctuary. And regardless of the spears or the bows and arrows or the number of people bearing armor, they would stand outside and not do harm to you because it was a safe place. How many are grateful God has given us a safe place to find faith, to find friends, and to find our future? So I'm gonna ask you all to stand. I'm not consecrating this place today. We are. I'm gonna ask us to lift our voice and, and in unison declare these words on the screen. And there's a posture of spiritual authority Maybe you've not experienced it very often in your life, but in case you don't know what it is, you can stand and put your hand forward. And the words that you declare following that have significant meaning in the eyes of heaven and on earth. And if you've never done it, it's worth trying because you'll be surprised. You can even tell on the inside. That's different than other things I say. So let's, let's put our hands forward and let's declare this out loud and together today. This is our consecration of this space. Heavenly Father, we set apart this place as a safe space for others to experience your grace for themselves. We set apart this place as a safe space to build life-giving relationships. We set apart this space as a safe space to discover the amazing future you have for each of us. And now we're going to make declarations of ourselves. So if you just take that same hand and just put it over your heart. This is what we are committing to God. We will do to make sure this place is a safe place for, for anyone who walks in. Out loud and together. We commit ourselves to welcome those you bring to us with hospitality. We commit ourselves to look for greater and better ways to serve you and others. We commit ourselves to listen for what you want us to say and to pray. We commit ourselves to generously sharing with others what you have generously shared with us. In the name of your son, Jesus, we say amen, amen, and amen. Let's declare the goodness of God in the house today. We sing, your promise still stands.